The enteric nervous system, the second brain. Um, it is the, <laughs> the nerves that innervate the gastrointestinal tract in a nutshell. To better understand what it is, why it gets called the second brain, how it works, what it does, why it exists, we should look at the anatomy. I think I'm going to have to do a quick run through of the divisions of the nervous system just to get us warmed up. And then we need to think about what movements, what motor functions does the gastrointestinal tract need to be controlled? What sensory apparatus might exist to feed into this nervous system? And then how are they linked? What are those interneurons, those reflexes that then autonomously control what the gut does without necessarily needing input from higher centers. That is the method, I think. The nervous system then. Right, well, we have nerves throughout our body collecting sensory information and sending out motor neurons to drive muscles and things like that, right? Um, we divide it up so we have the central nervous system. That's the brain and the spinal cord. Everything that comes out from there is the peripheral nervous system. And then we further break it down to so the somatic nervous system, somatic of the body. Um, we are aware of these sensory inputs generally. Um, touch, temperature, the skin's covered in somatic sensory inputs. And also then um, motor outputs that we choose to do. Moving skeletal muscles, that's all somatic. And then there's the stuff that we're not aware of, the autonomic innovation. The, uh, the processes that run automatically within our body, managing blood pressure and heart rate and how quickly we breathe and that sort of thing, right? So then that, um, the autonomic nervous system is broken down into, it has two motor parts, sympathetic and parasympathetic. So they're motor, they're driving things. Uh, the sympathetic nervous system is uh, involved in our fight or flight response, whereas our parasympathetic nervous system is involved in rest and digest. Oh, that seems like a big target for today then. And then we have the visceral afferent neurons, which are part of that autonomic division, sensing information from organs. Maybe it's blood vessel stretch, maybe it's the pH of the blood, um, maybe it's something else. But these are sensations that we're generally not aware of that go to the brain or maybe somewhere else and then trigger motor outputs and our body is automatically regulated. The enteric nervous system then is part of the peripheral nervous system because it's outside the brain and the spinal cord and it's part of the autonomic nervous system because it's automatically controlling the functions of the gastrointestinal tract but it is it is part of the sympathetic and parasympathetic divisions so sympathetic and parasympathetic innovation um, those fibers pass into the enteric nervous system and visceral afferent fibers, so sensory fibers from organs pass from the enteric nervous system back to the brain. So there are divisions, but necessarily they overlap because the parts of the nervous system are in communication, right? One of the things that people find interesting about the enteric nervous system is that it has been shown that it can operate if you separate it from the brain, so it's no longer connected anymore. It will still operate, it'll still look after the functions of the gut. Now, I, I think I would probably liken this to the heart and the sinoatrial node. The sinoatrial node, the pacemaker of the heart, we have a collection of cells there that will continuously depolarize. So you could take the heart out of the body, if you could keep it happy, and those cells would keep depolarizing, which would trigger the muscles of the heart to contract the heart would keep beating if you separated it from the central nervous system. But that's not how the heart operates. It has sympathetic and parasympathetic innovation which will tell the heart to beat faster or more slowly. The enteric nervous system is the same. It could be separated from the central nervous system, but normally it isn't. It, is, it can work autonomously, independently, but normally it is connected to the central nervous system. The sympathetic innovation is gonna come from the spinal cord at thoracic levels and the sympathetic trunk 
and work its way on from there. The parasympathetic innervation to the gut is going to come from cranial nerve 10, the vagus nerve. So we have sympathetic nerves and parasympathetic nerves going to and forming the enteric nervous system. And then we also have visceral afferent fibers running from the enteric nervous system. Most of them will follow the vagus nerve to get back to the brainstem. Some of them will follow sympathetic nerves to get to the spinal cord. But normally the enteric nervous system controlling the gut is linked to the, the brain. All right then, let's consider what actually needs to be controlled in here? What movements need to be organized? Well, the most obvious one is that this is a tube running through us. It's, you know, seven or eight meters long and it's a muscular tube. And when you put food or liquid into it, that food or liquid must be propelled all the way along the tube until it goes out the other end. Um, peristalsis is the method by which the there are uh, circular muscles around the gut wall and longitudinal muscles, so they can squeeze the contents and change the length to push food along the lumen, the inside of this tube. So peristalsis, and that peristalsis movement, not only has it got to be carefully regulated in that local area where it contracts in just the right way and shortens in just the right way to push food along, but that location of that peristalsis must also be happening in just the right place to push the food along. So that needs to be controlled. There are lots of hormones in the gastrointestinal tract that drive various processes and some of those hormones can be triggered to be released by neurons. Oh, the other one is of course blood flow. The gastrointestinal tract um, has a really, really rich blood supply, but in the body, there's not enough blood to go everywhere at the same time. So the body has to determine where to send blood at any particular time. So we talk about um, rest and digest, and we talk about the parasympathetic nervous system versus the sympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic nerves innervate smooth muscle in blood vessels, and when that smooth muscle contracts, blood is not gonna flow so easily through that blood vessel. So by controlling the blood vessels of the body, the body, the brain, the nervous system can control where blood goes. When you've eaten a meal, when you're digesting food, you have to send a lot of blood flow to the gastrointestinal tract because the food is gonna get digested. Those nutrients are gonna get absorbed across the cells and put into the blood and the blood is gonna carry those nutrients to the liver and off around the body, right? So we need to manage um, blood flow as well. That's a muscular and a neuronally controlled thing. What about sensors then? What sensory apparatus might we find in here? Well, we certainly find a lot of mechanoreceptors, stretch receptors. So mechanoreceptors are sensory nerve endings in the wall of the tube, and they're usually kind of like, you know, kinked or coiled and as they straighten out, that triggers the neuron to increase the rate of action potentials that it's firing. So as the, as the, the, the gut gets stretched, those stretch receptors fire, those neurons get switched on. So that's a big sensory thing. That's probably the main one actually, because um, um, there are lots of weird sensors that we feel, but often when you have kind of you know, colic or pain, in fact, clinically, Pain is often caused by overstretching of the gut. So that might be something we're aware of. There are chemoreceptors in the gut, detecting what's in the lumen of the gut. Um, there's a lot of chemistry going on during digestion and a lot of that chemistry has to be carefully managed. And of course, there are things like pH that have to be considered because we have stomach acid and we have to neutralize all of that. So there are chemoreceptors detecting all sorts of chemicals and maybe the metabolites of pathogens and, and that sort of thing. And then there seem to be a bunch of other sensors, so thermal sensors, uh, noxious sensors, um, possibly sensors for tissue damage and inflammation and all sorts of things. So yes, there do seem to be a lot of sensors inside the gut. Well, that means that if you've got sensors that can detect that food and liquid is passing into the gut and through the gut, through stretch and chemistry, then you only need interneurons to make reflexes, to make circuits that would then automatically control peristalsis and can control that wave of contraction of the, of the muscle tube, right? 
And that's why this gets called the, the second brain, partly because there are 100 million neurons involved in this, which is a, a fair few, um, but also because it is autonomous. We have sensory inputs going through reflexes that drive motor outputs, which doesn't need um, the brain to think about it. It doesn't need any higher function to organize. So we have kind of this, this little brain organizing the process of digestion um, as that food and liquid is passing through the gut completely autonomously or almost completely autonomously. All right, what's the anatomy here then? Um, well, we need to think about the structure of the gut wall. We can see it here. Um, we can see it here. The inside of the gut tube is lined with an epithelium. I talked about epithelium recently. Was that a podcast? Dissectable Me podcast, maybe? Um, so there's an epithelium, there's a mucosa because it produces mucus. We have an epithelium lining the inside of the gastrointestinal tract. That's what the nutrients are going to be absorbed through. Um, it's a mucosa because there are lots of glands in there secreting mucus, secreting other things to help with digestion. So the mucosa is that layer and then the submucosa is a supporting layer. There's a thin layer of muscle in there which helps give it structure and also helps fold it all up to give it more surface area. And in the submucosa, that's where we find nerves and blood vessels and lymphatics, right? And then the next layer out from the submucosa, we have two layers of muscle. We have some circular muscle running around the tube and we have some longitudinal muscle running the length of tube, two layers of muscle. And those are the muscles that are really doing peristalsis. Between those two layers of muscle, we have some more nerves and all of these nerves are linked. So those nerves in the submucosa are the submucosal plexus. So a plexus is, um, you know, we have lots of neurons, their axons are just running and crossing over. It's like a, a web, a mesh of, of neurons. They're not necessarily connecting, although there are some connections. Anyway, the submucosal plexus runs all the way from the esophagus, the entire length of the gut um, to the other end, to the, the rectum. And the submucosal plexus, um, we're seeing some sensory neurons in there, so those stretch receptors and uh, chemoreceptors, we're seeing some inputs into the submucosal plexus. We're also seeing neurons that trigger glands to secrete, because we're finding those in the mucosa and the submucosa. And we're finding the nerves that regulate the blood flow to the GI tract. So those, those blood vessels um, supplying blood to the GI tract, those arteries and arterioles, they have smooth muscle in their walls. And that smooth muscle is going to be told to contract by sympathetic nerves. So when the sympathetic innervation is off, blood can flow through easily and the, the blood, fly, blood flow to the gut increases. So the submucosal plexus, we see sensory inputs, we see regulation of blood flow and regulation of glandular secretion to a certain extent. The submucosal plexus is also known as Meissner's plexus. That's the, uh, the older name for it. Uh, I said there were other nerves in the muscularis externa layer between those two layers of muscle. The nerves you find in there are called the myenteric plexus, myo meaning muscle enteric. So the myenteric plexus again runs from the esophagus all the way to the other end between those layers of muscle. Um, this is also called our backs plexus and the nerves in here, so this plexus is connected to the submucosal plexus. And clearly it's this plexus that's going to be involved in organizing the contraction of those muscle layers to propel food along the gastrointestinal tract in a very carefully coordinated manner. So clearly then there are sensory inputs that can control this or trigger this. So then that's what we mean by the enteric nervous system. There are sensors within the gut, and as we pass food and liquid into the gut, those sensors detect that that food is there, either by the tube being stretched, um, or by detecting the chemicals of absorption or whatever we put in there. And that sensory input then passes out to um, motor fibers which will, for one, um, so there's a, there's a reflex here, there are connections within the gut, this isn't something that has to go to the brain and back again, but that sensory input can then 
trigger carefully organized muscular responses that propel the food along or control the, the functions of a sphincter to aid in digestion. And then there are also those other motor outputs, so um, telling glands when to, when to secrete and when not to secrete to aid in absorption. And then also we have the motor control of blood supply to the gut to increase blood flow to aid in digestion and decrease blood flow when digestion isn't occurring so blood can go somewhere else, right? Um, so it is this autonomic self-contained thing but it is also sending sensory information back to the brain. Much of it we're not aware of some of it we are, you know, I feel full, I feel pain. These are all senses from the gut going to the brain that we're aware of. And then also um, general motor outputs from the brain. So we say the parasympathetic nervous system is involved in rest and digest. So parasympathetic innovation through the vagus nerve um, drives, switches on the gastrointestinal tract and drives the passage of food through it and absorption to occur. And then the sympathetic nervous system will shut it down again. So an example of that is um, when you feel nervous, when you feel, you know, stress and fear, you feel it in your gut, right? You, you know, you get butterflies in your tummy or you don't, you don't feel so good. And what's happening there is, you know, with stress and fear, um, your adrenal glands are producing adrenaline and that adrenaline is switching on the receptors to the sympathetic nervous system, such as the blood vessels to the gastrointestinal tract. So the sympathetic nervous system is, is turning off the blood supply to the gut, and you're, you're feeling that, you're feeling that reduced blood flow. And when that fear passes, when you relax, and everything turns back to normal, that, that is, you know, the blood supply to the gut returns, and you, you're aware of that, you're aware of feeling better. Um, the reason it does that is because, as I said, there's only so much blood to go around the body. And in a fight or flight response, when you have to survive a situation, um, more blood goes to the brain, more blood goes to the muscles and what have you. So you've got that energy and you, you, you can think clearly. You're warmed up and ready to go, right? So the enteric nervous system operates autonomously, but it is not separate from the central nervous system. They are linked. As with much neuroscience, this is still not fully understood and is continuing to be elucidated. We talked about uh, the vomit reflex recently. Um, we, we talk about brainstem reflexes a lot, right? We talked about the vomit reflex, and that's an example of, of how uh, the brain and the enteric nervous system are linked. Um, it turns out that many of the neurotransmitters being used in the gut as part of the enteric nervous system are the same as the neurotransmitters used in the brain, which shouldn't really be too surprising. And it has turned out recently that the neural links between the gut and the brain are much larger than was previously thought which is why there's a lot of work going on right now to better understand how the gut affects mental health and vice versa. There seems to be a lot going on there that people are starting to work out. So the enteric nervous system actually, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a pretty topical bit of anatomy. Um, but there we go, the enteric nervous system, the anatomy of mm, how it all works and links together. But it's, it's, um, that's what we mean when we talk about the enteric nervous system. Interesting, huh? Okay, see you next week. <laughs>